Take your Bibles, go back to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to pick up our study on the, uh, the model prayer of Jesus, teaching us how to pray. And we're going to be zeroing in on one phrase, thy kingdom come. Prayer is about reigning. Let's read this together. You guys can read it on the screen or on your Bible, whichever you prefer. And we're going to read the Lord's Prayer together. It says, uh, we got it up here? Verse, let's start with verse 9. You got that up here? Verse 9, it says, uh, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Are you ready to say it with me? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Prayer is about reigning. As we continue down through this prayer this model prayer, I I hope that you can see that each of these phrases, each part of this prayer is building one part upon another. And that happens a lot in the scriptures. When you start reading the Beatitudes, you see that they kind of build one on another. And the same is true for this prayer. For instance, we begin by praying our Father. We talked about that week one. And, And we find out just how wonderful Our Heavenly Father is to know God is to love Him and to know how wonderful He is. And once you know God as your Heavenly Father, then you have a desire to see Him glorified. Amen? And so when you glorify Him, you say, Hallowed be Thy name. We're honoring and glorifying His name. It creates a hunger. Once we know Him and once we uh, reverence Him and glorify Him, it will create a hunger in us to see his kingdom come. And that's the next part of our, of our passage, to see uh, His kingdom come and to see other people ushered in to the kingdom of God. That ought to be the desire of every Christian. So to pray, hallowed be thy name, expresses a desire to see Him glorified. But we must also know that He will never be seen in His full glory until His kingdom comes, until the reality of His kingdom is here, both in us as individuals and on this earth as a whole. That's when he's going to be fully glorified as as the Father of heaven, the the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so we're praying for his kingdom to come. I hope you are anyway. Are you praying for his kingdom to come and to be established? It's going to be a glorious time, by the way. It's going to be a good day when King Jesus sets up his reign here. Well, we're going to look at these three little words, thy kingdom come. It's a small phrase, and it's got small words, but each of those words are powerful, and each word is important. The first word, thy, is a pronoun that refers back to our Father, which is in heaven. This isn't a, this isn't a human kingdom we're talking about. It's not my kingdom. It's thy kingdom come. It's God's kingdom in which it refers back to the God of heaven. And it tells us that the kingdom that is coming is not of human origin. It's a spiritual kingdom that will be different than any other kingdom we've ever known. When we visualize kingdoms, we think about castles and moats and uh, men in shining armors, knights in shining armors and, and princesses and all these things. That's not the kingdom we're talking about here. We're talking about a non-human kingdom which will be established by the king of kings someday when he comes his kingdom is the kingdom we're talking about a spiritual kingdom in fact in john chapter 18 and verse 36 uh, jesus answered and said this he said my kingdom is not of this world he said if my kingdom were of this world then would my servants fight but that i should not be delivered to the jews but now is my kingdom not from hence we're talking about the lord's kingdom and it is coming It's thy kingdom. Number two, the second word, and that is kingdom. His kingdom. We're asking for his kingdom to come, which comes from a Greek word that simply means a rule, a royal power, a kingship, a dominion, or a rule and reign. A a complete 
ruled by Jesus Christ. We're asking for his kingdom to come, his kingdom to come here and to rule and, and reign over us and over this world. And I'm looking forward to that. But we're also looking at the last word, come. Thy kingdom come. And that word is interesting. It's an imperative verb, and it means suddenly, instantaneously, or, or quickly. We're asking, so when we're praying for thy kingdom to come, we're praying that God himself will come and in a moment set up his entire kingdom and have complete dominion and rule and reign over this earth and over you and over me. And what a day that's going to be. What a prayer that is. It's a very noble prayer. And God someday is going to fulfill and answer that prayer. I'm looking forward to it. Let's, let's think about a few things that we can take away from this that, uh, that this passage can teach us about prayer being about reigning. Number one, if you have your programs, you can take notes. Number one, this petition is prophetic. It's prophetic, not pathetic. Many of our petitions are pathetic. But this petition is prophetic. It is something that's going to happen. First of all, we see what God has promised us. What God has promised. When you read the Bible, the Bible is very clear that God has often promised a future kingdom that is coming to this world. A future reign of righteousness. We look for a new heaven, a new earth, we're in dwelleth righteousness. We're looking for Jesus to come back and put his feet back on this earth and to establish his kingdom. And the world doesn't even know it's coming. And the world doesn't even know that they want it, but they do. It's going to be a great kingdom, by the way. It's not going to be like the kingdoms of this world. But it is coming. When we pray, thy kingdom come, we're asking God to bring his kingdom to pass upon this earth. We're asking God to fulfill his promises. And asking him to fulfill prophecies that we read about, about a coming kingdom that's going to happen here someday on this earth. I want to give you a few passages of Scripture. I'll go through them quickly, but you might just jot some of them down in your notes. Uh, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. There it is. You can see it there, but you can jot it down. I'll read it quickly. There the Bible says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and with justice, henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. His throne is going to be established forever. There's not going to be anybody to knock him off. There'll be no need for an election. There'll be no need for a re-election. There won't be any need for a recount. It won't be any partisan issues. It's going to be King Jesus setting up his rule forever. And it's going to be good. Uh, also, write this one down. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. It says, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never, never, never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to the other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Write this one down, Luke chapter 1, verse 32, 33. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. In his kingdom, of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Write this one down, Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory as surely as jesus was born onto this earth as surely as jesus lived here and lived a sinless life as surely as he died and rose again as surely as he ascended back into heaven that same jesus is coming someday to fulfill all of these promises to fulfill all these prophecies and to establish his kingdom here and when you pray thy kingdom come you're asking him to fulfill that promise we better be ready for that and what a what a time it's going to be. It's going to be a time of power and glory and righteousness. And notice not only what God has promised, notice what God will produce. What God will produce, this future kingdom that is coming is going to be vastly different than any kingdom ever before. All the earthly kingdoms that we have seen and have been established and destroyed and, and risen and destroyed again, all of those kingdoms have been tainted with sin. 
our kingdom, our government, our lives are all tainted with sin and there is evil at the core of all of them. In fact, the Bible tells us that right now this world resides under the dominion of Satan. He is the little G God of this world. Look at 2 Corinthians 4 4. You'll see that there. He is ruling over this earth to some degree. He has some power and influence. He is the prince of the power of darkness. And he, he influences the world and the kingdoms of the world to work evil. All these kingdoms are tainted with sin. But there's coming a day when that won't be the case. In fact, the Bible tells us in Romans that all of creation groans under the strain of all this sin and all this wickedness. Everything in this world lies under the grip of sin. But someday, when Jesus not only uh, fulfills these promises, He comes and He establishes His kingdom, His kingdom is going to break the grip of sin and restore righteousness to this earth under His rule and under His reign. And boy, is that going to be vastly different. How many of you love to talk about government and politics? Some of you love to talk about it. Some of you just love to fight about it and argue about it. And it's fun to sit down and drink coffee and argue and fight, isn't it? Don't y'all love these commercials on right now, all the, all the mud slinging and all the votes? And Hey, I got good news for you. When his kingdom comes, no more commercials for that. And I'm Matt Raines, and I approve this message. When he establishes his kingdom, it's not going to be tainted with sin. It's going to be a kingdom of righteousness and glory. And he's going to have dominion. There's coming a day when Jesus is going to rule. The Bible has a very clear statement. Revelation eleven fifteen. Let me read this to you. I don't know if it gets any clearer than this. And the seventh angel sounded. And there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he... He shall reign forever and ever. Man, what a great day. There's coming a day when he will provide a kingdom for us. For now, Satan is the little g-god of this world. For now, he is blinding men to the truth of the gospel. For now, he is wreaking havoc. But in that day, he shall be bound and cast into a bottomless pit, not to tempt anyone, not to hurt anyone. He won't be able to do anything. He won't be able to hinder anybody from coming to Christ during that kingdom. He'll be bound for a thousand years, according to the book of Revelation. Today, Israel struggles with the blindness regarding their Messiah. But in that day, they will bow down and worship Jesus as God. They will see him for who he is. Today, cre uh, creation is is groaning under the pain of sin. But in that day, it will be delivered from all of that. Today, churches exist in weakness and humiliation. And they, they exist in fear. Tares growing up together with the wheat. But in that day, but in that day, Jesus will glorify His church he will cleanse it and make it pure and he'll put it into his image. The church will be perfected into his image. And what a day that is going to be, friends, when we're set free from all of this. No more bondage. The world we live in today is, they're bound by all this. The kingdoms that we live in today. But in that day, it's going to be different. He's going to provide a great kingdom, and only Jesus can do these things. And one day he will. He'll bind the devil. Well, I'll be glad for that. Because I don't know about you, but he bothers me. He's kind of getting on my nerves, to be honest with you. If he's not bothering you, if the devil's not bothering you, then you're not doing much. He ought to be bothering you. And that day he's going to bind him. And he is going to restore creation. He's going to glorify his bride. I hope you're part of it. And he's going to claim dominion over all the earth. So when we pray, thy kingdom come, we're echoing the groans of nature. And we are echoing the great songs around the throne for his glory. We're, playing, we're praying for his righteous rule and reign to come and be established right here, right now. Suddenly, instantly, quickly. He's going to do it. 
I love, I don't have time to read all this because I always preach too long, so I won't. But you write, write down Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verses 11 through 21. That's a lot to read. But I want you to read it sometime when you get a chance this afternoon because it tells you that when Jesus comes to establish his kingdom, it's not going to come in increments. It's going to come, it's going to come quickly. Even so, come Lord Jesus, right? He's going to come and he is going to wipe out. He's going to wipe out the kingdoms of this world. It says there's a sword proceeding out of his mouth and he's going to cut down these kingdoms and establish his kingdom. That's a powerful passage of scripture right there. You ought to read that this afternoon. His kingdom will be established instantly by his own power. He'll rule and there will be a time of peace. There will be a time of prosperity, holiness, which this world has never known. So we ought to pray daily. You ought to make it your model prayer. Pray daily for his kingdom to come. This petition is prophetic. Number two, this is where we're going to, this is where the rubber is going to meet the road. Are you all ready? This petition is personal. You're like, uh-oh, Brother Matt's going to get personal. That's what I do best. I had somebody asked me recently if I should use my finger when I'm preaching. He said, do you think you should be pointing when you preach? And I said, well, how else will they know who I'm talking to? I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. Or oh, listen, this petition is personal. Listen, if you can come to the house of God and read the scripture and it doesn't talk to you personally, then you have not ears to hear. You're dull of hearing. This is a very personal petition. It, first of all, it's about seeking God's will is what it's about. Just as surely as we're praying for the appearance of his future kingdom, we're also praying that his kingdom will be realized in our lives as individuals, our very own lives. It isn't just that Jesus is going to establish an earthly kingdom. He's already establishing rule and reign in our lives, or at least he should be. You remember the word kingdom means royal power, kingship, dominion, and reign. It's not something that is just happening in the future prophetically. It's something that is supposed to be happening personally right now in my own life. I am to give kingship and lordship to the Lord Jesus Christ. When we pray, thy kingdom come, you're asking God to come and establish his kingship in your life. So you better mean it when you pray it. Or don't pray it. You're asking him to have rule and reign. The petition expresses a desire for God to be our Lord, our sovereign, our king in my life. And ultimately what that means for us is, listen, listen to me. It means that I have to learn how to dethrone the other gods in my life from off of my heart. Because so often we allow other things in our lives to become masters in our lives. And we tend to enthrone them. I enthrone myself. That's the greatest temptation is to enthrone myself. My kingdom come, my will be done. Not his, mine. And that's when I'm sitting on the throne. And that's a great temptation. And what happens to us is we sit on the thrones of our own hearts and, and we decide what we will and will not do. We have dominion over ourselves. We have sovereign reign over ourselves. And we allow other things to come into our lives. And we take these little things and they're minor things. And we, make them, we make them masterful things in our lives and they become the little gods of our lives all because we are sitting on the throne of our own hearts. Now let's be honest now. I told you it's going to get personal. Let's be honest now. Many of us enjoy sitting on the throne of our own heart. You know why? Because when I sit on the throne of my own heart, I get to call the shots. I get to decide what I will do. And it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to pray thy kingdom come into my life. Now, it's a grand thing. Oh, I can't wait for the day that Jesus is king and there's no more president. I don't need a president. And hashtag not my president and all those things. We won't need all of that. We all like that idea. But we don't all love the idea of thy kingdom come to my heart, Jesus. Because I kind of like being the king of my own life. That's a hard thing to pray. I like being in charge. Well, you're not in charge anyway. So what we have to do is we have to dethrone self.
Because when you're, when you're enthroning self, guess, what, guess who else you're enthroning? You're enthroning Satan into your life. He's the one. Hey, listen, he's the one telling you to call your own shots. He's the one telling you, you don't need to surrender to the Lordship of Christ. You don't need to do that. You, you, you don't let him tell you what to do. This is your life. Not according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. What? Know you not? That you are not your own, but you are bought with a price. What was the price? The precious blood of Jesus Christ. You're not your own. See, here's the thing. We cannot separate the lordship of Jesus from the Savior Jesus. He is Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. Do you get that? He's Lord and Savior. If, he's, if you don't want him to be Lord, then you're not ready for him to be Savior. We cannot divorce those two things. We can't say, well, I'm going to put him over here. Yeah, I want you to save me, but I don't want you to have lordship over me. The only way you can do this is by accepting Christ as your Savior, and you can put yourself under his rule and his reign, not only as Savior, but as Lord. And I can't tell you how many people are happy to, clear, to tell me that they're saved, that Jesus is their Savior. But they're not willing to make him Lord. Why is that? Because we love calling our own shots. When we pray thy kingdom come, we're seeking God's will. We're saying, God, I want you to be on the throne of my heart. And listen, it's not a democracy. <laughs> you don't really get a vote. You don't really get a vote in all this. You do what the Lord tells you to do. He gives kingship, lordship, sovereign lordship over your life. And you do what he tells you to do. And you say, well, listen, if I get saved, Brother Matt, you're telling me that sin is my old master. But if I give up my sin, it looks like I'm getting a brand new master in Jesus. Yes, you are. But he's a good master. He's not a slave master like sin is. You become a slave to your sin. We become servants of God, and he brings us into his family. And yes, he becomes my Lord, my Savior, my master. But he's a good master who only wants good things for his people. And I want to tell you this. Until you dethrone yourself and enthrone Christ seeking his will, you're trying to serve two masters, and you can't do it. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. You'll either love one and hate the other, hold the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So we have to dethrone ourselves and enthrone him, seeking his will, asking for his kingdom to come in my life. And that scares most people. Secondly, we see here that it's about surrendering to God's will. You know, it's one thing to seek God's will and to know God's will, but it's a whole other thing to surrender to God's will and say, you know what, I'm going to do what he wants me to do. A lot of people don't like this concept because a lot of people want to do this, and you probably have noticed this in your life, that people want a, a Jesus that they can mold into their image. I've noticed this. My Jesus wouldn't do that. My God wouldn't do that. Well, my God wouldn't do this, and my God wouldn't say that, and my God, you know, they don't like the God of the Bible. People want to mold Jesus in their image. But if you want the Jesus of the Bible, you must surrender everything to his kingship. Everything. This Desire is the mark of a genuine, true believer who says, thy kingdom come. Right here in my heart, I'll do what you want me to do. I not only seek your will, but I'll surrender to your will. You know, I've often said this, that when we come to the house of God, we ought to be predisposed to a few things. We ought to be predisposed to obey the Holy Spirit in his prompting. We ought to be predisposed to obey and respond to the Word of God as it moves us by the Holy Spirit. 
But so often, people are predisposed to do nothing at all. We sing the song, I am resolved. Many people are resolved to do nothing, <laughs> no matter what happens. I don't care what you say, Jesus. I don't care what the preacher says. I don't care how you make me feel in my heart. I'm predisposed, and I am resolved to not move. Some people love to sing, I shall not be moved. That's their favorite song, right? Like a tree planted by the water. You're not moving me. It's one thing to know God's will and seek it, but it's another thing to surrender to it. Surrender to his will. You see, when you become a believer, when you've been a born-again child of God and you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and you put yourself under his kingship, you become a citizen of another kingdom already. See, I have a dual citizenship. I'm a citizen of this world, the United States of America. But I'm also a citizen of a heavenly kingdom that is yet to come. I have a citizenship in heaven. And I am a dual citizen. And when you are a citizen of a kingdom, you're expected to come under the rules of that kingdom. And when you're a Christian, you ought to be under the rules, surrendering your will to the will of a heavenly kingdom. It's not your will anymore. It's God's will, surrendering to that. And, and when we don't live out these things in our life, when we don't dethrone ourselves and enthrone Christ, when we don't seek his will or surrender his, to his will, we are in complete rebellion to Jesus Christ. Now, I want to share something with you. Now, you, you get right on the edge of your seat. I'm going to say something. It's not in my notes, but it's in my heart. This is usually where it gets sketchy. I know. Partial surrender is total rebellion. That was a great place. I even paused and took a deep breath. And I don't know if the reluctance for the amen is because it hit home. I mean, is that not true? Is it not true? I mean, if you tell your kids, go in there and clean your room and clean that bathroom, they come home, they come home and say, well, I, I put up my shoes. You say, well, that's totally, that's totally fine. That's, that's all I really wanted anyway. Right? You enjoyed your electric bill this year? I got mine the other day. Surrendered all over again. It's been hard. It's so hot. And I called electric company. I said, listen, I, I know you want $300. This. I'm just going to give you 10 That ought to be good, right? I got 10 Making it rain. There's 10 bucks. That's fine. And they said, oh, yeah, there's no problem. Don't worry about it. You don't have to surrender all $300 to us. Just $10 will be just fine. No. What happens is if you don't surrender all that, they come to your home, and it gets really hot. They just unplug it all. See, partial surrender is total rebellion. When we don't surrender everything to God, we're living in rebellion to him. You know, I had a pastor friend of mine. He told me about the first time he met my dad, and I, I think I've shared this before, but he said, I, I couldn't stand your dad in the first five minutes I met him. He said, I went down to help him move. He became the new pastor of our church. He said, I went down to help him move. I'm picking up all of his furniture. He said, we got in the van to go back to the church to unload all of his stuff at his new home. And he said, uh, I told him, I looked at him and said, you know what? He said, I know that I am not where I'm supposed to be with God right now. I'm not really where I need to be with God right now. He said, your dad looked at me. He said, I'd known him for 10 minutes and said, so what you're telling me is that you are in open rebellion to God. He said, it made me mad. He said, I don't even know you. You know, you're going to turn and tell me I'm in open rebellion to God? He said, well, that's what you're saying. You're saying that I know that I am not where I'm supposed to be with God, then you're saying I am in open and plain rebellion to God. That's what you're saying. Because partial surrender is total, total rebellion. So let me ask you this, as we're doing this personal petition. Is there some area in your life where you've never dethroned yourself? Is there some area in your life you've not surrendered? Is there some area in your life, in your life, where you cannot pray, thy kingdom come into my life? And then if there is, you're in rebellion to God. And you need to surrender to his will today. And what you need to do is you need to get up 
off your backside and come right down here and get on this aisle and on these pews and you need to pour it out to God and say, God, I've been in living in complete rebellion to you and I have been surrendering to my own will and not yours. But today, today I pray for your kingdom to come into my heart and my life and you need to get it right, right here today and stop living in rebellion. And I figured that would be the only amen I got right there. This goes for all of us. You say, well, Brother Matt, I can't believe you, you're talking to us this way. I'm talking to Brother Matt this way. You're just listening. Number three, this petition is practical. You know, the lost, unbelieving world does not pray for his kingdom to come. You know that, right? They pray like this. Our brothers which are upon earth, hallowed be our name. Our kingdom come. Our will be done. Because there is no God in heaven. That's how the world prays. We're supposed to pray for his will. This petition is practical. We see a desire is expressed here. When you say, thy kingdom come, we're expressing a desire. Well, what desire is that? It's a desire to see his work and his word and his will advance in this world. I want to ask you a question. It's a personal question. We're not done being personal. Do you have a desire to see his work progress? I mean, does it ever cross your mind? Do you ever think about where Florence Street will be in the future? When we celebrated 45 years a couple weeks ago, you ever thought about where Florence Street will be 90 years if the Lord hasn't come back if he, I, I, hope, I hope in 45 more years he comes and establishes his kingdom here do you ever think about that do you ever seek to advance his word where you are to advance his will I mean we need to face the facts that this world is not going to get better through our efforts I mean there's nothing I can do personally in other words, it will not be until he ushers in his kingdom that we can see what we need to see here. But we can do our part to advance his work and advance his word and advance his will. Seeing these principles spread, apart, uh, spread abroad through our efforts. But he's going to bring his kingdom. But we can express a desire by being a part of what we're doing now. I mentioned this in my Sunday school class. There's a song on the radio called Dream Small. Maybe I mentioned it in a prayer meeting. I can't remember. And I like that song. The first time I heard that song, I wasn't really sure about what was happening in that song. <laughs> so I don't ever like a song the first time I hear it. That never happened. It, they had to grow on me. But it talks about how that when, you, when you're dreaming small, you're just affecting the area where you're at. You know, we kind of get this idea that it's up to us to bring in his kingdom. No, he's going to bring in his kingdom. Our job is just make a difference in our world. We don't get to change the whole world, but we get to change our world. We ought, to, we ought to try to change our world, where I'm at. I ought to try to touch the people who are around me and advance his word and his will and his work in their lives, and that's what you ought to do. And when you're doing that, you're helping, you're showing a desire for his kingdom to come and to spread. Secondly, there's a discipline that is experienced here. There are several ways in which we can do this first, by praying for his kingdom to come. We ought to pray for his kingdom to come and his will to be done in this world around us. So when Jesus is teaching us to pray, he says, here's the pattern, here's the template. Pray thy kingdom come. So when you pray, pray for it. Pray for it to come worldwide, pray for it to come individually. Secondly, through submission as we yield ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ so that he can live through us. Hey, his kingdom is not yet established. We know that. But there's no reason why the world can't get a glimpse of it when they look at you. I mean, why, why not? Why can't the world just look at his people and say, hey, there's a shot of what his kingdom is going to look like? I hope my prayer is that when people come to church here, they get a glimpse of heaven, of the family and the friends and the worship and, and the fellowship. It ought to be a taste of heaven. 
It ought to be a taste of what his kingdom is going to be like someday. Pray for it to come and submit to his lordship. And thirdly, through soul winning outreach. We can personally reach out to the people around us with the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. That will help increase his kingdom. Do you have a desire to see other people saved? Does that ever cross your mind? What are we doing to make that happen? That's the question. What are we doing to see other people brought into this kingdom? What are we doing as individuals or as a church to spread God's kingdom to this world today? Whatever it is, let me say this. We can do more. And we should. I want to close with a few thoughts here. I might have Brother Sam to come and our musicians to come. Jesus is going to physically and literally reign upon this earth someday. The angels said to the disciples, they said, Why stand ye gazing up into the sky, up into the heavens? This same Jesus whom you've seen go today shall come in like manner. He's going to come again. And he's going to put his feet back on this earth, whether you believe that or not, whether you like it or not, or ready, whether you're ready or not, he is coming someday to reestablish his kingdom, and nothing can stop it. The question is, are you looking forward to it? Now, I want to say this before we close today. If you have never made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, today's that day. You're not going to be looking for a great day to come if you've not made Jesus the Lord of your life. He's not just Lord, he's Savior. It starts right there. By allowing Him to indwell you and become your Savior today. By surrendering to His Lordship. Maybe there's someone here today who has enthroned themselves and has refused to let go. Today, I would ask you to let go of that. Let go of your sin, let go of your past, let go of your problems. Take yourself off the throne today and surrender to Jesus Christ. And ask Him to save you. And when He saves you, the Spirit of God will indwell you and then surrender to him and say God today I put you on the throne of my heart and then then you can pray with confidence and you can pray thy kingdom come but until then you're not ready don't wait if his kingdom is not coming to your heart yet today would be the day to do that lost person don't wait to give your heart to Christ. Didn't we learn a harsh reality this morning? We, we learned a harsh reality that tomorrow's not guaranteed, is it? With the announcement that was brought this morning. How old was Sarah? She was 32. No tomorrow. That's a harsh reality. What is your life? It's but a vapor that appeareth for a moment and then vanishes away. The Bible says, take no thought for tomorrow, for you know not what a day shall bring forth. So if you're here today and you've never surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, do that. Give your heart to Him today. Turn from your sin and embrace Him as your Savior. He'll save you completely and entirely, forever, once and forever. Maybe if you're just here today and never dethroned yourself maybe you just need to deal with that maybe you just need to come and ask that God would establish his kingdom in your heart today because you've been stubborn and you've been holding on to your sin and your will and your way would you release that today